The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Daniel Fusco Ministries. Check this out from today's edition of Real with Daniel Fusco. What's important, I think, for us is to realize that God also has a standard of beauty. And too many of us today in the world that we live in, we think who we are is what we do. We have this idea that the benefits of Christianity come in the future. And they do, but actually, we're getting to live this in the present. People have different ideas about what is beautiful. You know, like, if you think about even even with what, what beauty is, beauty is a set of aesthetics that are pleasing to somebody, right? Like, it's amazing how you can, if you talk to different people, whether you're looking at music or art or even views of how we, uh, what we think is beautiful, uh, you know, in, in regards to other people, different people have different preferences that they find aesthetically pleasing. What's important, I think, for us is to realize that God also has a standard of beauty, And I don't think we ever think about that because our ideas of what is pleasing is so personal and really so cultural that we don't realize that God who created and sustains everything also has preferences. There are certain things that God sees and knows is beautiful. And what God is really interested in in each one of our lives is that our lives would begin to take on the characteristics of what he sees as true beauty. And the finished work of Jesus is actually designed to cultivate a beautiful life in each one of our lives. So in order to start breaking this open together, I want you to open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5. We're going to start with verses 3 through 12, Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12. So if you didn't bring a Bible with you to church, don't worry. I want you to uh, grab those books on the seats in front of you. Just open those up. Matthew's the very first of the books of the New Testament, the first of the four Gospels. Of course, if you have a smartphone, if you pull that thing out, type in Matthew 5, verse 3 to 12. It says this. It says... Then he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, that's verse two, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, these are known as the Beatitudes, right? And what's beautiful is if you notice each one of these uh, Beatitudes, and there are nine of them between verses 3 to 12, each one begins with the very same word, which is the word blessed. And I'd like to say it this way. A blessed life is beautiful. A blessed life is beautiful. So in order to put the the first foundation stone in, you have to realize that The blessed life is the beautiful life. Now, what's amazing about this, though, is when you read this list, almost all the characteristics that are described here are not things that we would necessarily see as beautiful. Notice, poor in spirit, mourning, meekness, hunger and thirsting for righteousness, mercy, pure in heart, peacemakers, persecution. Maybe some of those you might grab. 
But what we learn right away is that the blessed life is beautiful because this is a declaration not of what we're supposed to do, but who we are. Like it's been said this way, I love this. They're called the be attitudes, not the do attitudes. You like that, huh? Write that down. You can tweet that out. It's real good. Your friends will be impressed. See, the Beatitudes are a declaration of in Christ who we are. And too many of us today in the world that we live in, we think who we are is what we do. Right? And so it's about identity before action into the world. And the Beatitudes function in such a way to tell us who we already are if you are born again. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, this is who you are in Christ. Now, unfortunately for many of us, we're not living like this at all. But this is who we really are. And now, what's fascinating about this idea of this word blessed, in, in the Greek word, it's, it's uh, makirios, which literally speaks of somebody who has been blessed by God. You know, uh, the Greek adjective means to be fortunate or to be happy. And so there, there, there's something there for us. And so what you have to realize is, is that true happiness is not just enjoying circumstances. True happiness is realizing that you have been blessed by God, that God has bestowed a life upon you that was not something that you deserve, but he's chosen to give to you and you have received. And the true Beautiful life is one who is existing within this blessing. Now, what's interesting is that it speaks of delight. Now, what's also fascinating, notice it says in each one of these, blessed are, not blessed will be. Do you notice that? So all of this, the state of beautiful blessedness exists in the present tense. It's not in the future tense, and it's not in the past tense. It's designed to be right now. Now, I think that's super important, because oftentimes we have this idea that the benefits of Christianity come in the future, and they do, but actually, we're getting to live this in the present. You're blessed presently. So this is about not only the next life, but it's about this life as well. Now, also what I think is really fascinating about all of this, and you won't know it from the English language, but there's different moods in the Greek, the Greek verbs, right? And so what's interesting, and remember I said this is not about what you do, it's about who you are. That's also further exemplified by the fact that in the Greek, if you guys were to pull out your Greek New Testament, I know all of you brought that to church today. Just so you know, I don't bring my Greek New Testament to church either. I just study it in my, in my free time, you know? But the idea is that in the, in, the, in the mood, this is in the indicative mood, which literally means, see, oftentimes people teach the Beatitudes and they teach it as an imperative. This is a command of what you have to do. But the mood in the Greek is in the indicative, which literally means it's a statement of fact. That's how I said this is about who we are not about this is what you have to do, right? And so this speaks about who we truly are in Christ. But what is also beautiful is that we constantly see in these Beatitudes this reality that although it's who we are, not what we do, we still have something that we have to do. So God wants what we believe to be lived out. I say it this way, that what God is interested in is, is theology with legs on it, right? He wants to put feet on our faith. He wants us to live it out into the world. In applied theology. See, what's amazing is that within the church, there's so much cognitive, theoretical theology that isn't getting lived out. So, like, what good is it for scholars to sit down and debate and argue about the love of God when they don't love God or love each other? Like, it's, it's an adventure in missing the point, but what's powerful here is I want you to notice, blessed are blank for theirs is blank. Do you notice that? So what we really see here is that it's unconditionally that for those people who are this, this is what happens. 
Does that make sense? So who you are leads to some sort of an outcome, some sort of a reality. And I want you to make sure you get that because I think we live in a day and age where it's like, I will live godly if it gets me the outcome that I want, right? Or if, you know, I could follow Jesus and it gets me to heaven, but I'm really gonna follow Caesar because it gets me rich, which is trying to serve two masters, but it's unequivocal that if you are this, then this is what happens, right? And each one of these beatitudes, these statements of fact of who we are, each one of them has this is who you are, and this is what it gets. This is what, this is what it gets produced in your life. And I want to make sure you realize that, because really what this speaks of, it speaks of life in God's kingdom. What does it mean? So we're going to be unpacking that together. Now, what I want you to do next is I want you to turn in your Bibles Hold, hold, actually, you don't have to hold your hand. Just turn to your left to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 3. The second place that we're going to, or leg that we're going to put down, this center, it says this in Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now, if you had your ears open when I read the Beatitudes, and then I read Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, you see all the overlap? Talks about those who are mourning, those who are poor, those who are brokenhearted, those who are in captivity. Right? Those who are in prison. All, the, all these concepts keep coming up. I notice in the middle of verse 2 of Isaiah 61, it says, to comfort those who mourn and to console those who mourn, to give them what? Beauty for ashes. To restore something that is aesthetically pleasing to them in the midst of rubble. Now, the reason I bring this up is because Jesus quoted these verses in Matthew chapter 3. And Luke chapter 4, remember he went into the synagogue and he took the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he rolled it out and he found Isaiah 61 and he read it. And he read this and then he shut the scroll and all the eyes were fixed on him. And what did he say? He said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, why do I bring this up? Because what we realize is that beauty is a gift from Jesus. True beauty is a gift from Jesus. Before Jesus spoke these beatitudes, we have it in my, my, uh, Matthew 5. There's also another version of them in, in Luke's gospel. Before he did that, he quoted Isaiah 61. This beautiful passage. And so what you learn is that the beauty that truly pleases God, the, the beautiful life or a beautiful faith that pleases God comes as a gift. It's not something that you do. It's something that you receive, which transforms who you are, which now leads you into a way of living. See, Jesus is saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because I have come to preach the good news to the poor. And then there's a whole set of outcomes that come from that. And so if we get, before we get any further, if you want a beautiful life, it's about putting your faith and trust in Jesus. And not just believing in Jesus one time when you say yes to Jesus, where you commit your life to him and you allow Jesus to forgive you and you identify your life in totality by surrendering your life to him so that his death and resurrection get applied to your life. But it's about following Jesus every day as well, walking with him. It's true for all of us. Life is messy. And because life gets hard, oftentimes we think, man, I'm never gonna be happy. And people are bound to ask, doesn't God want me to be happy? I always answer that the same way. Absolutely, God does want us to be happy. But God's plan for happiness is found in unexpected places, places that we wouldn't have looked for it. I found this out at a time in my life when I was just going through some stuff where things weren't quite working and I decided I was gonna look 
What does Jesus say is God's plan for happiness? And I found it. I wrote this book called Crazy Happy, Nine Surprising Ways to Live the Truly Beautiful Life. And I cannot wait for you to get your hands on it. I promise it's gonna change your life like it did mine. But I'm here to tell you, if you follow Jesus, you know that your life will be beautiful in the eyes of God. And God's ways are different. And Jesus wants to give you this beauty as a gift. He came to preach so that this stuff happens. Now, moving from there, I want you to turn back to the New Testament. I want you to turn past Matthew's gospel to the book of Galatians chapter 5. So Galatians 5, verses 16 to 26. Verse 16 of Galatians 5. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that, they do not, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited provoking one another, envying one another. Now I like to say it this way. When you walk in the Spirit, beauty grows as fruit. When you walk in the Spirit, beauty grows as fruit. Now, what you have in this text is the Apostle Paul is juxta juxtaposing setting at odds with one another, who those of you like juxtapose, what's that? Setting, setting at, at opposition to one another, life in the flesh and in the spirit. Now when he says in the flesh, he doesn't mean living in skin. Flesh is a way of living that is living in rebellion against God. There's God's way and then there's a way that seems right to us. So you have flesh against the spirit. And what you learn is that if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because the flesh is has passions against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and they are at odds with one another and they're enmity with one another. But if you are in the spirit, you're not under the law. And then it says, and the works of the flesh are evident in these things. And, and there's a huge list of things. Now what's amazing is, is almost nobody, if you read the list of the, the works of the flesh, nobody will say that those things are beautiful. Right? I mean, like, does anyone want to say that adultery is beautiful, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries? Anybody here want to say that those things are beautiful? So the lusts of the flesh are not beautiful, but what's amazing is if you read the fruit of the Spirit, everybody would agree that all these things are beautiful. Look what it is. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So when you walk in the Spirit, beauty grows as fruit. Now, what we're going to do in this beautiful series is this, and this is what blew my mind. If you read the Beatitudes, there's nine Beatitudes. If you read the fruit of the Spirit, guess how many there are? Nine. I've never seen somebody put them together. And what's amazing is, is for each week, we're going to take the first Beatitude and the first fruit of the Spirit. And you're going to see how they work. I'm not going to mix the order up. And when I tell you, brothers and sisters, there is so much for us there. 
Now I have one more center I just want to put in place. I want you to turn back to your left to John's gospel, John 15. Now again, we're going to be focusing down on the Beatitudes and the fruit of the Spirit in this series, but I didn't want to miss this because we have, first we have this idea of the blessed life is beautiful and that Jesus gives it as a gift. And now we see that beauty, it grows as fruit as we walk in the Spirit. But I wanted to talk with you about fruitfulness before we close this message out. John 15, so the fourth of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So you just turn back to your left a little bit. It says this in verse one of John 15. It says, Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word of which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides at the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now don't miss verse eight. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Brothers and sisters, when you abide in Christ, fruit grows. When you abide in Christ, fruit grows. He says, look, I am the vine. And so vines and vine dressers, we, you, most of us don't, aren't running vineyards here, you know, but the idea is it's like, you know, the vine is the trunk and the vine dresser is the gardener, okay? So there's a tree trunk and we are the branches. And as we abide in him, we receive life from the vine, which is Jesus. And Jesus tells us that when a branch doesn't bear fruit, it gets pruned back or taken away. But everyone that does bear fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. Now, I'm not a, a big gardener. I know a lot of people who are, and you know this better than me. But it's like, if you want something to grow, you cut some of it away so that it can become more full. There's an old saying, if you cut one shoot, two grows in its place. Now, if you ever wonder as a follower of Jesus why sometimes God is taking things out of your life, it's because he loves you enough to prune you because he wants you to be more fruitful than you would if that's all you had. It does not change when God's taking things out of your life. It does not change the way you look at it. You're like, oh, if I'm bearing fruit, he prunes so that it'll bear more fruit. God desires to produce beautiful fruit in your life. But it comes as a gift of Jesus as we walk in the Spirit and we learn how to abide in Christ. And we're going to do that together. I'm so happy you made it to this part of the program because God loves you and God has a tremendous purpose for your life. God created you perfectly. And in order for you to be able to live out exactly who God made you to be, you need to follow the Lord. And the only way you can follow the Lord is by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. And I realize that there are many of you who maybe have never put your faith and trust in Jesus, trusting in Him that God loves you enough to send Jesus to die on a cross for your sins. Or maybe along life's way, you did say yes to Jesus, but you've gotten away from Him and you know that you need to recommit yourself to that journey of simply responding to Jesus. So if that's you either for the first time or maybe it's time to recommit, I want you to pray a simple prayer with me right now. So if you can, go ahead, bow your head in your heart and repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. I believe in you, your life, your death on the cross, and your resurrection. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me and teach me to follow you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And we all agreed and said, Amen. 
If you just said yes to Jesus, I am beyond excited for you. And I wanna help you with some resources to take the next steps as you begin following Jesus. But I need to know that you said yes to Jesus. So pull out your mobile phone, that info's on your screen, and text the word SAVE to 51400. Someone from my team will get back with you and we'll get some information to get you those resources. But listen, don't go anywhere. I got a big idea that I can't wait to share with you. What's up everybody, Daniel Fusca here. So almost everyone I've talked to is a little bit crispy given all that's gone on in 2020 with this pandemic and all the things going on. And I am just blown away. I shouldn't be, but I'm blown away by God's perfect timing because in just a few weeks, I have a brand new book coming out called Crazy Happy, Nine Surprising Ways to Live the Truly Beautiful Life. And I want you to pre-order that book. The reason why is because the book was written out of a time when I was feeling particularly crispy and I went to the scriptures and say, God, don't you want me to be happy? I mean, I just feel so just shriveled up by everything. And God unpacked scripture to me. And I just felt like I had to write this book. And I am blown away that this book is coming out in the midst of maybe the crispiest season in the life of everybody I know. So listen, go pre-order yourself a copy of my book, Crazy Happy, Nine Surprising Ways to Live the Truly Beautiful Life. Trust me, I guarantee you're going to be blessed by it. You can take part in the amazing work God is doing through the powerful message that, although life is messy, Jesus is real. By partnering with Daniel Fusco Ministries, you help make programs like this available to people who may not otherwise experience the love and hope only found in Jesus. With your regularly scheduled partnership, your generosity can help transform lives forever. Go to danielfusco.com partner now and become a part of the Daniel Fusco Ministries support team with your regularly scheduled or one-time gift. Be the hands and feet of Jesus in your world and become a partner today. Hey everybody, Daniel Fusco here. Welcome to today's Two Minute Message. No matter where you are, start your weekdays with an encouraging thought from Pastor Daniel. You'll find his popular Two Minute Messages on Facebook, or you can subscribe to them on YouTube so you don't miss any of them. Each weekday, Pastor Daniel brings insight and encouragement on important topics that affect your life in only two minutes or less. Join the community now. Go online and search for Daniel Fusco on Facebook or Pastor Daniel Fusco on YouTube. So we're just about out of time on today's program, but I would love to stay connected with you. Go to my website, danielfusco.com. Make sure that you sign up for the weekly newsletter. There's so many exciting things that are going on. That's the easiest way to find out about all of it. Also, I wanna thank so many of you who are joining us with prayer and financial support. Your partnership is essential to us reaching more and more people with the simple message that Jesus is real. So if you wanna join us in that, go on my website, danielfusco.com slash partner to get more information. I'm on all the social media accounts. Many of you love the two minute messages on Facebook, on YouTube. Find me on Twitter and on Instagram. And I would love if you don't have a local church, join us at Crossroads Community Church. Our online campus is reaching the entire world. Okay, here's the big idea that I wanna share with you. Make sure you take the initiative to love other people because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Okay, I gotta go. But never forget, although life is messy, Jesus is real and he loves each one of us even in the midst of our messy lives. God bless you. Have an amazing day. Jesus is